Growing up, one of my favorite TV shows was a strange Japanese comedy called Sayuki. Known outside of Japan as Monkey or Monkey Magic, it lasted only 52 episodes. But the English dubbed reruns became a cult hit in the 80s and 90s. At first, I had no idea that this series was based on the Chinese classic novel Journey to the West, a story over 400 years old, which itself is a fictionalized retelling of a Buddhist monk's journey to India over a thousand years ago. To be honest, I didn't even know the show was Japanese. But as I grew older, I noticed the characters and storylines appearing in other media, and slowly, I began to understand how truly influential this novel has been on modern culture. During my research for this video, I have found that in the century since the first Journey to the West film was made, there are now over 220 movies and TV shows based on its story. Which brings us to the question Why is Journey to the West so popular? Sherlock Holmes and Dracula are arguably the most retold and reimagined characters from modern Western fiction. Since the dawn of cinema and the advent of television, there is rarely a year that goes by where they have not appeared on screen in some form. Their characterization, adventures, and appearance are now so iconic that they have become kind of a shorthand for character archetypes in Western storytelling. Simply saying their names or showing a piece of their ensemble immediately invokes the characters and an understanding of how they will most likely behave. In Asian fiction, no characters are more evocative or iconic than those of Journey to the West. The Ming Dynasty novel is centered on the Buddhist monk Xuanzang, known in the West as Tripitaka, who is sent on the titular pilgrimage to India to fetch a set of holy scriptures and save the souls of China. While the novel is based on the real story of a rebellious monk of the same name, his fictional counterpart is quite the opposite. Within the story, Xuanzang is naive, passive, and in most cases finds himself kidnapped by demons who believe that eating his flesh will extend their lives. While he does often chastise the other characters for acting immorally, he mostly exists in the story as a master in distress, someone to be protected, rescued, and whose primary goal serves as a vehicle which fuels the rest of their quest. Zhu Bajie, or Pigsy, one of the most popular characters of the group, is the reincarnated spirit of the Marshal of Heaven, who was banished to Earth after getting drunk and sexually assaulting a moon goddess. His soul was sent into a pregnant pig, resulting in his iconic half man, half pig looks. As denoted by his appearance, he is characterized as greedy, lustful, and lazy. His companions, and often the narrator of the book, often refer to him as an idiot for his lack of self control. The two most often forgotten characters of the group are Sha Wu Jing, known as Sandy, and their trusty steed, Bai Lu Ma, or the White Dragon Horse. The horse was originally the Dragon Prince Ai Long, who was to be executed by his father after he accidentally burned a royal treasure. He was later released, and after a short battle where he ate Xuan Zhang's horse, he himself was transformed into a horse and ordered to carry the monk on his journey. He rarely speaks or plays a role in the story outside of one or two instances, and as a result, is the most overlooked of the characters. While Sha Wu Jing, or Sandy, has a more active role, he is also one of the least celebrated companions. Like Pigsy, he was also cast down from heaven, but for the much more minor infraction of breaking a vase. Upon his reincarnation, he lived by a river, killing travelers and using their skulls to make a necklace. Once defeated by the pilgrims, he converts to Buddhism. His necklace is transformed into his distinctive prayer beads, and he joins the quest. In China, it's a common joke that his role in the journey is to act solemnly and occasionally cry and tell others that the master is being kidnapped. And the character, which stands above all as the most recognizable and most influential, is Sun Wukong, the Monkey King. While Xuanzang's journey to India is the basis, Sun Wukong is most definitely the main character. The first chapters of the novel tell the story of Monkey's birth from a stone egg, his quest obtaining immortality and mastering Taoist magical skills, as well as his fight to take over heaven, all climaxing in his defeat at the hands of Buddha. After being imprisoned in a mountain for 500 years, he is released by Xuanzang, who outfits him with the iconic golden circlet, which crushes his head if he disobeys the monk. Wu Kong is played as a fun loving trickster, but at the same time as an arrogant wildcard. Who, equipped with his legendary gold banded cudgel, is an extremely powerful fighter. Admittedly, the basic traits and personalities of these characters are nothing new, 
even by the standards of the 16th century. As mentioned before, Xuanzang and the story itself is based on the exploits of a monk by the same name, and many argue that Sun Wukong himself is inspired by the Hindu god Hanuman. But it is their simplicity of what defines them, not their origin, that has given them such long-lasting appeal. The benchmark for good character design is to visualize them in an empty room and being able to know exactly how they will respond to any given stimuli. Even someone with a cursory knowledge of the characters should have no problem predicting their behavior. The personality of each member of Journey to the West is so well represented by their appearance and actions that it becomes impossible to separate these traits from these characters. The happy-go-lucky fighter, the greedy fool, the helpless master, and the ones that everyone forgets. The cast of Journey to the West have become permanent character archetypes in fiction. Just as a deerstalker hat immediately brings to mind a brilliant yet slightly egotistical detective, the Golden Circlet just as clearly evokes a wildly powerful yet immature monkey. As a child, I loved watching these crazy characters battle their way across the world, though I never once considered why. While the characters are undoubtedly classics, and the action can be fun, as an adult, I now understand that the true meaning behind Journey to the West is perhaps something much deeper. The Ming Dynasty was an interesting time in Chinese history. The shift towards sea trade facilitated greater interaction with the wider world, but at the same time, the dynasty became more isolationist in nature. Even so, with improved printing processes and increased literacy rates, art, theology, philosophy, and fiction flourished. The strongest influences on culture at the time, namely Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, are exemplified in its works, and especially in Journey to the West. Within the text lies complex and interwoven themes of a Buddhist universe that has merged with Taoist mysticism, all held together by Confucian order. This has led many to debate the underlying intent of the author. Some claim that the novel is a parody of the ineptitude of bureaucracy, noting such events as when the journey was finally over. Even the keepers of the heavenly scriptures demanded bribes, despite the fact that presenting scrolls was their sole duty. For me personally, I tend to agree that although it is a Buddhist allegory, the meaning is not totally religious in nature. I believe that Journey to the West is a story of personal improvement and fighting inner demons, starring characters that symbolically represent different aspects of the human condition. Xuanzang, the reincarnated spirit of the Golden Cicada, and the real-life perfecter of the Heart Sutra, quite literally depicts the body and the heart. A heart is compassionate and kind, yet in the face of adversity, it is often weak and fragile. It is only with the strength of mind that we are able to accomplish our goals. Physically, it is perhaps through correct cultivation and ceremony that we are able to shed our mortal shell and discover our true selves. Sun Wukong, I believe, represents the duality of the mind. On the one hand, the mind is a powerful weapon. Just as Wukong wields his cudgel, we are able to go beyond our limits and break down every barrier in front of us. Yet, at the same time, symbolized with his golden circlet, we must learn restraint and how to control our anger if we wish to find true purpose. This is famously taken to its thematic extreme in one chapter, where Wukong must fight the six-eared macaque, a power-hungry and violent imposter who disguised himself so perfectly as Wukong that only Buddha could tell them apart. The chapter ends with Wukong killing the imposter, figuratively destroying the older, unrestrained version of himself. Pigsy, I believe, illustrates our own greed, pleasure, and consumption. His Chinese name, Zhu Bajie, translates to the Pig of Eight Precepts, a vow that Buddhists take to abstain from earthly proclivity. At the end of the novel, Pigsy failed to control himself, and is the only character not to achieve enlightenment. As a result, he is given the role of cleaner of the altars, perhaps showing that although not everyone can be saved, there is still some place for them. To me, Sandy describes regret. Being cast down from heaven for a seemingly minor infraction, he becomes a river demon and a murderer. I believe that this may show us that not only can bad actions send us down a wrong path, but redemption is possible if we are truly repentant and do our best to make amends. Even the horse, though mostly overlooked, I think is an example of duty and quiet responsibility. We all have our own burdens to bear. But if we take it step by step, 
we can eventually get the job done and reap the rewards of hard work. Like I said, this is just my own thoughts in the story, and that's what makes the novel interesting. No one is technically wrong. You are free to interpret it as you wish, which ensures that the story will continue to be retold in a variety of different ways. We have seen it represented as a soppy love story, a coming-of-age tale, propaganda inciting war and the defeat of enemies, and of course, as a kung fu adventure fighting monsters. Which brings us to the final section. Chinese characters like Mulan have seen many screen adaptations and might be more of a household name in the West thanks to the Disney movies. But for better or worse, there is no single story or character in all of Asia that can boast as many versions produced as Sun Wukong and The Journey to the West. In my research for this video, I found that there were no definitive lists anywhere on the internet detailing exactly how many movies and shows existed. Spoiler alert, I made a list. The link is in the description and you're welcome. Not including cameo appearances, I have found that as of this writing, there are about 220 films and TV shows that are directly about or inspired by Journey to the West. In my making of the list, I realized that most of the movies fall into one of four categories. The retelling, the crossover, the reimagining, and the appropriation. The narrative of the original novel is structured very much as a series of self-contained yet connected adventures. Each chapter almost always ends with the narrator speaking directly to the reader, asking them what they think will happen next and encouraging them to read on. It feels almost as if you're reading a comic book or watching a Saturday morning cartoon. As a result, it's no wonder that retellings are by far the most common of all screen adaptations. TV shows and cartoons usually start from the beginning of the novel and go on from there, but the films often choose whichever chapters translate easily to film with little context. Notable examples are the 1986 Journey to the West CCTV series starring Liu Xiaoling Tong as Sun Wukong. Chances are if you turn on a TV in China, it will be playing this show. And of course, Sayuki or Monkey, the campy Japanese TV show that introduced me to the novel. The crossover. While not exactly common, there are a few movies and shows where the main characters will be transported to the world of Journey to the West. Western adaptations frequently use this style with disappointing results. The 2001 American TV series The Lost Kingdom and the 2008 film starring Jackie Chan and Jet Li both see a modern-day white protagonist transported to the world of Journey to the West. Neither adaptations are good, and you are not missing anything by skipping them. For a more successful example of this style, I would recommend the 1988 animated mouthful of a title, Doraemon, The Record of Nobita's Parallel Visit to the West. It's a fun and wholesome adventure without being a disservice to the original. The reimagining takes the basic story and characters from Journey to the West and creates a new universe or continues on from where the original finished. These adaptations are most commonly manga and anime, such as Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball or the 1978 Starzinger which reimagines the story as a space opera. I would also recommend the Korean animation Fly Superboard and the Hong Kong film series A Chinese Odyssey for interesting takes on the formula. The appropriation is where a movie or series has nothing to do with the actual story of Journey to the West, yet still takes a character, usually Wukong, and have them take the role of the lead or side character. I assume this is done to create some kind of instant recognition for their IP, but as with the crossover, the results are mixed. The 1989 anime Goku Midnight Eye takes place in a Blade Runner type future with Detective Goku, a man who is brought back to life, given an extendable cudgel and implanted with a supercomputer in his eye for unexplained reasons. With over 200 films and TV shows, it is impossible to cover them all here and it would just distract from the point of this video. But these many adaptations show the strength of Journey to the West and demonstrate perfectly how a story from the Ming Dynasty is more popular now than at any point in time. Xuanzang the Priest, Zhu Bajie the Pig, Sha Wu Jing and the Horse, as well as Sun Wukong the Monkey King, their simplicity and iconic characterizations have allowed them to transcend their medium, exciting the imagination of children for over 400 years. And it is the deeper themes and messages that will stay with us well into adulthood and ensure that people will continue interpreting and adapting this story long after we have left this world. So, to answer the question, why is Journey to the West so popular? Well, in the words of a classic childhood TV show, it's because the nature of Monkey is irrepressible. So, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. 
Uh, this one took a really long time to put together, but I hope it was worth it. If you're watching this on the first day of upload, you can come back tomorrow for the full list of every film and TV show of Journey to the West. But as always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Wukong, and goodbye.